Good evening, welcome to Millennium Stage. Tonight's show is a part of the Page to Stage Festival. If you haven't heard about it, we present almost 60 different th DC theater groups in the Kennedy Center over three days. It's amazing. If you want more information, we have programs at our visitor information centers scattered throughout the building. All right, I'm gonna hand the mic off to Mark from Washington Improv Theater. Thank you, AJ. Hello, everyone, welcome. Um, uh, can, can I hear uh, applause from anybody who's been at a Washington Improv Theater performance before? <laughs> Excellent. Welcome back. And who's, who's seeing a WIT show for the very first time? Make some noise. Oh, so many new people. Excellent. Um, well, Washington Improv Theater, it's a nonprofit uh, theater company in D.C. We, we're in our 19th year, and our specialty is doing unscripted comedy performances. Uh, of course, this performance is called Page to Stage, so uh, you need pages in order to be here. So uh, we are actually going to be introducing scenes from our upcoming season of plays. Uh, each one will be improvised, but using suggestions from you. Uh, we have a wonderful ensemble cast of performers to put together these productions. So let's give them a warm welcome. Cast, come on out. My name is Mark Schalfan. I'm the Artistic Executive Director of Washington Improv Theater. And your cast tonight, from your left to your right, is Laura Barber. Alex Kazanas, Erica Johnson, Zach Mason, Caitlin Kemp, Alex Beard, Jenna Hall, Robin Duty, and Jules Duffy. Have a seat. So this upcoming season for Washington Improv Theater is a complete roller coaster. There are so many timely events that we were trying to touch on in this season. Um, obviously, uh, Acts of God, recent political disgraces, uh, and of course, Taylor Swift's latest single. Um, so for me personally, as an artistic director, I've kind of kept the phrase, look what you made me do as a mantra as I pulled together these shows. Um, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, let's meet the director of the first show, the kickoff show of the season, Laura Barber. You're starting us off in style. Tell the audience what we have going on at WIT this fall. Thank you so much, Mark. Hello, everyone. Gosh, I am so thrilled to tell you about the first show of our upcoming season. It's called The Sahara. Now, when we started working on this, people told me, animal dramas don't sell. I said, I'll show you. The Sahara is a story about lions, but it's also a story about two brothers, Bob and Wally. Bob tonight will be played by Alex Beard, and Wally will be read by Zach Mason. You know, when I started writing this, I'm also the playwright. <laughs> um, when I started writing this and I said, I want to make a drama about lions, people discouraged me. I went back to my collaborators, Michelle and Mama Kay, and they, they supported me. They bolstered me and they said, no, the world needs to see this. Bob and Wally are two brothers, two lion brothers locked in sibling rivalry. Wally is known for his perfect mane. Well, Bob is known for being the lion with dandruff. <laughs> Today's scene that they'll be, that Zach and uh, Alex will be reading, finds the brothers lost in an unknown oasis of the Sahara as rain falls on them for the first time in their lives. And they discover what it means to be subject to those cooling droplets, and also to each other's rage. Uh, please go ahead. Do you feel that? The rain? Yeah, what is that? I feel it on the outside and on the inside. Oh, s strange. It's, it's so strange. I, I, I just, I've never seen anything like this before, and... I mean, we're in the Sahara right now. It, it should be hot and, and temperate. But it's not. It's, 
A flash of lightning, a roll of thunder. The rain starts to fall harder. I just want you to know that if we die in whatever this stuff is... Brother, don't say that. No, you need to hear it. If we die in whatever this stuff is, I just want you to know that you have a perfect mane. And I want you to know that I've been telling everyone that your dandruff is not dandruff. Thank you. Thank you so much. I was really worried that all the other lions and lionesses were looking at me thinking, ugh, what a disgusting animal. They were. But, but I thought you were trying to protect me. They trust their eyes. As the brothers but gaze at each other, are re having reached a new understanding, an unfamiliar lioness played here by Caitlin emerges from amidst the trees. <sighs> the things that I've seen, uh, the storm, it's coming. Do you have shelter? I don't know. Cool, Wally, play it cool. I don't know if we have shelter, but I have dandruff. Oh. Don't lead with that. Oh. Well, it's obvious. We all know I have dandruff. But you're also sweet and caring. We've banished all of the lions with dandruff from our tribe. I'm not supposed to be seen with anyone with dandruff. I don't have dandruff. Hang on, hang on. What? Something, something's, something's happening to me. Something's happening right in this moment. And, and, and oh my gosh. My, my dandruff, it, it appears to be disappearing. Something that's falling out of the sky is making my dandruff disappear. Oh, oh great, good review. Rivulets of dandruff laid in water run down his pelt. Oh, may I brush my mane against yours? That seems kind of like a weird request, but sure, why not? <laughs> the sense of comfort for me, it's what we do in my tribe. When we're feeling lost and alone, we brush manes. Imagine feeling lost and alone. You have a perfect mane. I don't want to hear it. Are, are, are you two brothers? <laughs> How could you tell? Oh, the noses gave it away. <laughs> oh. Identical. Wally, I, I just want you to know that I love you. <gasps> Thanks. And the lights slowly fade. End of scene. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, cast. Um, it's interesting, uh, because this show is our first in the season and it's happening this fall, we have an extensive youth engagement program that's part of this production with daily field trips. Laura, can you talk about the theme of otherness in this play of yours and what you're trying to convey to youth? What I'm trying to convey to youth is that it doesn't really matter what's going on with your mane. It's how you connect with your siblings and the people in your community and how you find love. Uh, we took many field trips with our youth engagement program to the zoo, to hair salons around the District of Columbia, uh, so that people could observe firsthand that kids need to see how people care for themselves and each other. And that's what we try to accomplish out in the community and with this play. Thank you, Laura. Um, after this production, um, the season takes a wide, uh, a, a rather a wild turn uh, to the left. And helming that next project is Mr. Alex Kazanis. Alex, tell us what you are doing this fall. Uh, this fall, you're in for a treat, uh, figuratively and literally. This is a, a subject that is very near and dear to my heart as it is to yours probably as well, baking. Yes, baking and imperfection. Uh, Sticky Notes is an upbeat tale of coping with imperfection, and, and today uh, Jules and, and Robin will be reading the parts of, of Sunshine, uh, a baker with a good head on her shoulders who just wants to do the right thing, and, and Lloyd, the head chef, a persnickety cake architect, this is a scene, a very pivotal scene, where Sunshine misspells the name on a wedding cake. To be used in the film, uh, or the final scene, rather, and must confront uh, Lloyd. 
we, we open on the kitchen of the Sticky Times Bakery. Lord, have you seen the cake? I have, sunshine, I have. I don't know how to spell Mara either. It's her wedding day, and I can't help but think that I'm the reason that it's going to start off on the wrong foot, that we are. No. And what this means for us. Our imperfections have nothing to do with Mara's ability to fill out her paperwork. If she had done that properly, we could have spelled her name right. We need to find self-love. No, these brides, they come to us at a moment where they are looking into the tunnel of what their future can be and to expect them to fill the paperwork out correctly. Well, my God. Sunshine picks up a colander and looks through it. Just spelling Full isn't our thing. Just like this argument. No. Full of holes. Sunshine. Have you ever looked to the holes within? Perhaps if we plug those with things more substantive than flour and sugar, such as self-love, we'll be able to overcome these clerical errors we make on the cakes at your bakery. So you're saying that it isn't just the quality of my cakes, but the quality of my character that will define me going forward? Yes, sunshine, yes. This is the kind of managerial Strength I've been yearning from you. Lloyd takes a sprinkle of sh uh, sugar and, and throws it into the air as if it were a, a flurry of snow. Fagah! <laughs> the sugar moves about freely and with self-respect. I don't ever remember being this free. As free as that was. Sugar is both bad for you and good by itself, which are sometimes like human relationships. Like you are, Lloyd? Are we gonna both talk about for me, me now? Both bad for me and good for myself. We black out. Thank you, thank you, cast. Thank you, Alex. Alex, I understand that you brought to this production your own personal struggles with baked goods. Can you talk at all about that? Yes. Um, I actually don't really know anything about baking at all. Um, and it's been, it's been like a demon. Uh, I, I can't sleep at night. Uh, I try to follow the recipe, but I just can't do it. Thank you for sharing that. We leave the world of baked goods for the next production in our season and go someplace mysterious yet alluring. Director Jenna Hall is going to tell us about our next project. Yes, thank you, Mark. So the next production coming soon is entitled The Easter Bunny Comes to Dinner. It is a horror. <laughs> Written by the great playwright Emma Smith, the first character, Odette Griffith, will be played by Erica. Melanie Jones, her partner, will be played by Caitlin. Odette's parents, who Melanie will be meeting for the first time, will be played by Lura and Alex. Of course, the part of the Easter Bunny will be played by Zach. We are in the dining room of the Griffith household. There is an ominous creature banging on the dining room window with a carrot. What could it be? And begin. Odette, if this is your idea of a sick joke, I don't think it's funny at all. Melanie? Mm. I... Melanie, I love you. Yes. Please remember that. I love you. I love you so much, Odette. I didn't want to come here today. I knew this was a bad idea. I'm so sorry. I don't mean to offend you, but... No, no, no. You have a lovely home. 
Um, and it seemed like a very nice girl. However, <laughs> my husband and I are quite terrified that a very large creature outside banging on the door. What is that? Are we going to die? Yes, I've seen such a thing in my dreams. Or should I say nightmares? He has the worst dreams. <laughs> I got cream eggs. Oh, oh no, God, no. Oh. No. We see in the window the Easter Bunny is holding up several eggs, cream <gasps> dripping from them. He's crushed those eggs. Does he know that I'm vegan? Does he know I'm infertile? <laughs> what? 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 I'm infertile. What? No. What? What? I'll huh? never. Have children. She won't. We went to the doctors this week and they told her. And we weren't sure how to tell you guys, but I guess this was the best way. I'm sorry, we're, I'm not going to I'm not going to be a grandmother. Well, no. 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 no, no. Oh, God. Well, I can still reproduce. No. Yes. No. Yes, I'm fertile. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We could make that work, right? We can, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Easter Bunny holds up a single long carrot, drags it down sideways on the window. No! Ow! Oh, it's hurting me! The carrot is hurting me! No, Melody! Oh, 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 Dad! I don't... Oh, Please. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Stop it! Uh. Oh no. Come get some of these vitamins. <laughs> I'm never gonna have grandchildren now. <laughs> no. She was the only fertile one. <laughs> she was the only one who ever loved me. <laughs> but End scene. Thank you. Thank you, Cass and, and Jenna. Um, Jenna, when we had our first production meeting to discuss that work, it, it, it was a children's theater production. Yes, I decided it needed a darker turn, and so I made the Easter Bunny evil. I see. Uh, well, I commend your choice. Really revolutionary. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, our, our next production in the season is hopefully not quite as terrifying. Um, because we're hoping to mount it during the holiday season. Uh, and directing that show is the renowned director, Jules Duffy. Thank you, thank you. So uh, the play that I'll be directing um, is in the style of Shakespearean comedy, and it's called George's Slow and Unfortunate Demise. Um, so it's sort of a look at what happens at court in the shadow of King George's long and slow death. Things are very topsy-turvy as they, those things go. Um, in the scene that we're going to see, it's between Queen Mary, who's going to be played by Jenna, and the court jester, who's going to be played by Alex. Um, they've been having an illicit affair, uh, but the jester, Acorn, would like to bring that to a close because he believes that Mary's been too controlling. So without further ado, a scene from George's slow and unfortunate demise. Uh, Queen Mary, Queen Mary, uh, I wanted to talk to you in private for a moment. Oh yes, let's hear it. Uh, Queen Mary, I, b I believe uh, things have gotten a little too saucy between the two of you and I. Oh, you say saucy, I say necessary. <laughs> I believe the uh, brisket has been on too long. It uh, must be pulled off the stove, so to speak. You want to remove the meat? Yes, a I, Acorn, would like to remove the meat from the fire. Oh, but I'm not done yet. Well, sometimes in life, Queen Mary, uh, I do apologize. I know I'm speaking to a queen right now, but sometimes in life, there are times when you must uh, wait. And now's the time to wait. Well, as queen, I have decided that I do not want to wait. I want to continue. Well, this is putting me in a predicament that is challenging on an, a number of ways, mostly because I am a jester and you're a queen and I would like to stop fornicating. <laughs> I said it. That's what I meant by meat. 
but you see, just uh, somewhere along here, I've fallen in love with you. It's not just about two bodies coming together, it's about Shh. love. I wouldn't say things like that out loud. I'm just a jester. No, no, but I'm, I'm willing to break rank. I'm, I'm willing to take this risk with you, jester. I'll run away. Have you ever eaten slop out of an old coconut husk? No, but that sounds exciting. It's not. Scene. It's just sad. Yes, and that's Blackout. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Cast and Jules. J Jules, tell us, what is it about this production that made you think this was the right show for the holiday season? There are scenes where there are songs that have sort of a jaunty sort of bent, so that felt like the holidays to of me. Of course. And it all does end up being okay, even though it's very dark before the dawn, as in most comedies, it ends on a fun note. So it's sort of like a love actually of plays. Can you give us uh, any hints without being a complete spoiler? The king dies. Oh. <laughs> well, that does but sound it, it like doesn't the sound, It's not as sad as it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jules. Thank you, cast. Mm -hmm. Next up, we have a first-time director with Washington Improv Theater, Erica Johnson. What are you doing in the early spring of our season? What am I doing? What I do every season. Often ask where I get my inspirations for my work, and I would like to say I get it from life, living every day. Every day, I've been inspired by Anna Devere Smith, how she takes pieces from real people to make real art. The play I'm presenting to you today is Welcome to the City. It's an edgy drama about what happens when you address people without seeing them. Two characters, a woman, strong, human, frail, as all humans are strong and human and frail <laughs> and a little awkward. Alien almost, but human. Captain Smootmo, played by Laura. Our second char character, Teddy Hammond. Teddy Hammond, played by Alex Kay. The perfect gentleman, strangely perfect. Alienly perfect. Our drama de begins with a debacle at an improv show. He's called on stage. He doesn't like being laughed at, and the audience dies. <laughs> Which is a problem for these co workers turned friends, and this evening turned lovers. Captain Smoot Moo thought her biggest problem was flight complications, but it gets worse. We open in the street. Teddy, you've murdered everyone in the audience tonight. <laughs> You're not going to get away with that. Oh. I'm going to have to cover for you again. I am afraid I will get away with it. I often do. And you always succumb to my wiles, Captain Smutmut. It's true. So long we've been traveling together through space and time, looking for a home together. I've often turned to you for comfort. Hmm. Out in space, light years between stars, Teddy. We've landed here finally on Earth. And you've cocked it up. You've cocked it up, Teddy. Oh, please. This is it. No, no. Don't patronize me. Mm. I'm still your captain. <laughs> and you can, oh, you can waggle your wiles in front of me. But you've waggled your last. The sky opens. The mothership. Oh, it's returned. Your punishment, Teddy is that you stay here alone. Alone with, with all of these humans? Yes. I'm, I'm afraid I simply can't do that. I... But I need some space, Teddy. I need some space and some time. 
A beam of light shines on Captain Smoot. Mm. Maybe someday, light years from now, I'll return to Earth and find you again. Teddy. Captain, please, how can I go on without you? I only know how to kill humans. I don't know how to <laughs> live with them. The beam of light raises her higher. Teddy. Captain. You just, just think of me. Think of me when you look at those humans. See my face on their face. My hands on their hands. My legs on their legs. My voice with their voice. She reaches the top of the ship. It zooms into space. Love them, Teddy. I, I didn't even get to say farewell. It starts to snow. Blackout. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cast and Erica. Um, uh, actors, uh, Alex, Lura, I understand that over half of the full production time of this play has you suspended in midair above the stage. Can you talk about the technical training? And, and really, Erica, can you talk about the actor or the director's process in dealing with those physical limitations on a performance? Well, the physical limitations are, are human limitations. Fear, fear, chafing. So much chafing. Yeah. The Gold. chafing is very intense. Yes, Gold Bond was a godsend. Uh, by the way, and, this has been brought to you by. Yeah, sponsor. Thank you, Gold Bonds. Yes, thank, thank you, Gold you. Bond. Thank you. Yes. But mostly we try to take the play where the play wants to take us. There have been nights when Laura crashes to earth, and we deal with the repercussions of that, of being trapped on the floor for the rest of the evening. I was actually in traction for three months during rehearsals. But it gave me a little extra perspective on what it means for Teddy to be trapped on Earth when I was trapped in my own body. Indeed. And in your character. You stayed in character for all three months. Well, yes, amazing. that is my method. Mm. And I appreciate it. Thank yes, you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all for that look inside the process. I understand that there's a considerable change of tone before our next production. Uh, and that's being brought to us by director Zach Mason. Thank you, Mark. Yes. Um, first, uh, before we get started, I just wanted to give a shout out. Uh, my writing partner, James, is here tonight. Uh, we've been working on this play for about seven months. He said he was going to be here tonight. I, I don't see him. I I'm sure he's just stuck at the back. We're going to push forward. We're going to show. Hang in there, Show's Zach. going to go on. I'm sure he's out there, or he, he could be okay. watching online. Yeah. Seven months. Our play is called Difficult Mad Libs, and it's a murder mystery. We're going to have a free spirit, a beautiful free spirit named Cilantro, played by Caitlin, and an even freer spirit, equally beautiful, played by Mr. Alex Beard. I would like to ask Jenna to be the librarian uh, because this murder mystery takes place in a library in the Pacific Northwest. And we open by the card catalog. Books, books, books. There's nowhere else I'd rather be on a rainy Tuesday. What's up with the Dewey Decimal System? What's that about? <laughs> oh, sorry. Are we being too loud? Yes, you are both being too loud. I'm going to need you guys to turn it down. I guess that was really a, a question for you. What's up with the Dewey Decimal System? What's that about? Well, we've been doing it for years, and at this point, I don't want to change it. He's very curious about everything. <laughs> I'm a little more laid back when it comes to pages, books, bound books, feeling the book in my hand, connecting with the words on the page, turning page from page from page, next chapter, 
What is it going to be this time? <laughs> if you two don't mind, I have a lean cuisine in the freezer that has been waiting for me. I am going to go ahead and warm that up. No, no I don't mind. But uh, I just got a quick question. Lean cuisines, what's up with that? Oh. Blackout. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Zach and, and players. Um, tell me, Zach, wh what, what would you consider the central theme running through this production that audiences should be looking for? I thought it was friendship, but maybe not. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Zach. Yeah. Our next production um, is an astounding feat. Uh, when we had our production meeting talking about it, um, we weren't sure that we could commit the resources required uh, to mount this production. It's fully half of our production budget will go into the lights and the set for this show and this show alone. Alex Beard will be directing it. Alex, tell us, how are you spending all that money? What are we doing? Yes, this is a very interesting concept that I've been working on for a number of years. This show has been in pre-production for a total of 23 years. Uh, this show is originally, it was going to be a tragedy, a very sad piece, but uh, we, it, it is called, the title is The Interstellar Cheesecake Wars. But it's actually, uh, we've remapped it, and we've reconstituted the show. It's now going to be a children's theater piece. Uh, it's again called The Interstellar Cheesecake Wars. Uh, and there are three main characters in this piece. Uh, we have uh, Wally, who is played by Robin. We have Anthony, who is played by Zach. And we have Jeff, who is played by Alex. Now these pieces, uh, Wally is a magician on the planet Glucose. And Anthony is the fearless leader. And uh, Jeff is always falling asleep. That's just what he does. Uh, and what we see in this scene is uh, these, these members of this, uh, this band, this children's uh, band, uh, they are rolling down a sand hill and gravity, for some weird reason, is turning odd and off. So this is really where a lot of our budget is going. Uh, so uh, this, this anti-gravity machine, uh, I, I would like uh, you all to take it away on the planet glucose, please. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Jeff has fallen asleep. Typical Jeff. Now listen, I want to make it be known, the fact that the gravity is turning off is not one of my tricks. This is just a part of glucose. I'm going to drink my juice box now. I support that decision, Anthony. Oh no, drops of juice are going everywhere in this zero gravity. Man. We see droplets of juicy juice floating across the sky. Ah, oh, oh, that tastes good. <laughs> mm. Hey, when did this happen? There's juice everywhere. It's very slapstick, Jeff. <laughs> oh. Guys, I'm upset. We came to Glucose to do a show together, to bring laughter to children, in which I would do tricks Anthony, you would lead, and Jeff, you would just remain present and awake. Well, that's what I do best. Jeff, don't kid yourself. Jeff, you have a lot of strengths. Being awake is not one of them. Listen to our leader. That's true. That's true. Ever since I was a child, I, I always thought that I would excel at this kind of work. Being at the forefront, looking out into the, to the abyss and dreaming and, well, I always knew that I could be... Oh, Jeff. Oh, boy. Jeff. We see a large spaceship land right next to where the men are standing. Interstellar glucose life. I wonder if they will have any ideas how to interact with gravity here. Out of the spaceship comes Queen Leopold. What are you doing here? Wally, you got this. <laughs> okay. We have traveled to glucose for magic. Do you think it's 
Pania to mock me. Say no, Wally. Anthony, I wasn't mocking her. I'm just a magician by trade. Whoa, oh, what's going on? Who's that lady? It's Queen Leopold, and she's mad, Jeff. Hold your tongue. Sleepy man. Uh, hi. <laughs> I'm Jeff. You, ma, 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 pique my interest. We see Jeff wink. <laughs> oh. I want him. I need him. Queen Leopold, pick a card. Scene. <laughs> oh, thank you. As you're most welcome. What is it about the planet Glucose that inspires you as a location for this work? Oh, it is very sweet. It's a very sweet planet. It's cool, it's mm -hmm. tasty, mm -hmm. it's very good. And the, the, the unique dialogue style of Queen Leopold, wh what is that trying to convey to audiences? Oh, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a uh, repetitive motion. I'd like I, when I was creating this script, I was working on an elliptical, a machine, I was going the back oh. and forth, oh, and I, I just, I would write a few letters and I would forget where I was, and then I would write a few letters more, oftentimes leading to have too many letters. I, I also think as an artistic choice, it really highlights her power in this world and shows that she's a bit of an other, but she still, once she, once she comes and she speaks, she commands attention and commands people to listen. So I feel as an artistic choice, it really highlights her character. Yes, my in inspiration for this was uh, none other than Queen Bee, as uh, Beyonce. Oh. Yes. I see, I see. Well, thank you for sharing those You're insights. Most welcome. Um, originally, that production was scheduled uh, to be Washington Improv Theater's entry in the Women's Voices Theater Festival. Um, after reconsideration, we, we decided to move it to another slot. And in fact, uh, Caitlin Kemp took over directing uh, a brand new show for uh, the Women's Voices Theater Festival. Caitlin, tell us what is coming up in the winter of 2018. Oh, I am so excited. I wanted to first say thank you so much to Mark and the Washington Improv Theater for um, allowing me to be their artist in residence. This season, I come from across the pond, if my accent didn't give it away. And I have been working with some of my collaborators over there as well on this next piece, which is a bit of a rom-com. I think this genre is very popular here in the States. And the title of this piece is Just Mary, or sorry, Just Arrived, dot, 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 from Denmark. All right, yes, uh, some of my collaborators in the audience tonight are from Denmark. Joan and Anders, they're sitting right here in the second row. Please give them a round of applause. This show would not be made possible without them. So much love to you too. Um, so yes, in this, uh, this rom-com, me and the collaborators really wanted to bring to light uh, you know, the idea of young love and, and how naive we can be, how silly we can be, how one door closes. Sometimes we keep that door closed and it's never to be opened again until somebody comes along and completely changes your mind. And I'm sure I'm not the only one who has felt this before in their life. Um, but hopefully through this story, we are able to open up those doors that we have closed. So this story features um, a young woman named Margaret who will be played by the lovely Jules here on the end. Uh, Margaret is a 24 year old. She's just graduated from university. She is very put together and she works um, at the local cafe called Aardvark Cafe. Um, in comes Paolo. He is in Italian. He's 19. This will be played by the lovely Robin Doody here next to Jules, yes. Um, Paolo um, has a beard. He's 19, as I said. He looks a bit older than he actually is, maybe an act of deception to try to fool people into thinking he's a little bit older. And he's taking some time off before his first year at university to kind of find himself. Now, we find ourselves at Cafe, Aardvark Cafe. Jules is working, and Paolo is starts to enter. One fun fact about this. Jules's character, Margaret, was just dumped by an Italian man named Giuseppe. 
and she has closed her door to all Italian men. In comes Paolo. Begin. Welcome to Cafe Aardvark. May I take your order? Oh, hello. I am very pleased being at the, oh God. the cafe with you. Oh, God. Um, Why I have a kind of reaction to the way I speak? I'm sorry. It's uh, your accent. It, it, it Too melodic? No. Um, what? I recently had my heart broken um, by oh. someone with that same accent. I'm sorry. This Amore. This the love. It is a sickness we wear like the stench of the city. Suddenly, and all of the lights in the cafe go out except for a single spot on Margaret and Paolo. The love, it knows when it's being discussed. I find that people from where you're from, they know how to give love so freely and so intently, but you take it away as quickly and as intently oh, as Bella. you gave it. So I'm afraid I oh, would Bella. have to ask you to leave my cafe Bella, because no. I cannot. Please do not hold me responsible for the actions of another man. But if I may describe to you what the love is, it is a series of moments. And when they roll, some are good, but some hurt like war. Suddenly, the door bursts open, and Margaret's ex, Giuseppe, walks in, played by Zach Mason. It's a me. <laughs> You've got a lot of nerve. Is this the man? That is him. Do you know him? Giuseppe, he is. He's always on the corner. He's very loving. He's hey, a loving Paolo. man. Hey, Giuseppe. Paolo and Giuseppe are friends. That was nice. Do you guys mind having this reunion outside? Because this is a little much for me to take Giuseppe, right now. Giuseppe, did you know you broke this kind of woman's heart? Now she does not believe in amore. Oh, Paolo, you have only heard the one side of the uh, story. Is this, this is true. Tell us what she's heard. Oh, you want to hear the other side of the story? Yes, please. Oh, I'd like to, too. This will be very interesting. There's a young couple in the cafe played by Alex and Jenna who are intently listening and chiming in on the story details. Ooh, this is getting juicy. <laughs> Everybody, gather around. Everybody, take a deep, long sip of your Pellegrino. Take a deep breath and prepare to engage emotionally. Well, there I was, in the piazza. The lights go dark, and there's a single spot on Giuseppe. And I see the most beautiful woman in the whole world. Spot up on Margaret. <laughs> and I say, may I please sketch your beautiful face? I make money on the street, sketching beautiful faces. You never sketch my face, honey. I knew that was coming. <laughs> But did you let her know that uh, her face was a beautiful by comparison, or was it more of a business transaction? That is not the amore. Giuseppe. To be a true, truthful, it did start as a transaction. Margaret starts to get frustrated that the story has now derailed and wants to get back to the story. Um, yes, we all know how we met, but what I'm saying is the way that I was dumped, which was what was so horrible. Giuseppe. It was a text. <laughs> Blackout. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, cast. Um, Caitlin, this, this, this piece touches on a, a theme running through, throughout the whole season, how technology intersects with, with our lives. Um, my understanding is that there is actually a, uh, an online and mobile-friendly module connected with the, the production. Can, can any of you from the show talk about that and how audience will be connecting to the performance? Yes, yeah, so we've actually um, set up a, a texting account uh, just to give some live updates on where, where we're going with certain characters. Um, locations that will be when, when we're um, in the process of producing the show. Um, so when we're on location, guests can come and see what we're up to. They can ask some questions, um, maybe give us some ideas about um, what, what could be in this scene, some emotions of things. It's a very collaborative process. And uh, another reason why we are connecting over um, technology 
is uh, for the collaborators who cannot be in the States with us so that they can be more connected to the process instead of just some emails or a Google Doc that is sent out to them so they can be right in the room with us at all times as well. Yeah. If, if uh, anyone would like to talk to me after the show, I can give you the URL for the uh, Super Mario 3 playthrough that I used uh, for my dialect work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin Thank you. And, yes. and players. Uh, the, the next show in our season will be helmed by Robin Duty. Uh, you're going to have a busy spring, aren't you? Go immediately from the show into directing. Tell us what you have in store for. Absolutely. Absolutely, Mark. Um, well, the spring is... A delightful time to begin a new kind of chapter in the year's program. And this comes from a very, very hot writing trio named Anna, Sophia, Jojo, and Charlotte. And it's a pleasure to have their expertise at the Washington Improv Theater. The play is called The Adventures of the Horse and the Pig. And it's, of course, cast with Erica as the pig and with Alex Kay as the horse. Now to strike the emotions of what has happening for this horse and the pig, the pig is a princess. The horse is an artist. The horse's self-esteem is low because he is not rich. And the pig's self-esteem is low because she does not believe she is artistic. Naturally, they meet and fall into a sad comedic story of love. We rise in our first scene at the stable where Princess Pig is visiting outside of the castle. Princess, it's lovely to see you again. Mm. Hardly. Don't say that. Why? Everybody else does. Ah, but they cannot see the beauty that I see. Yeah, this tree is nice. It shades it so you can't see me that well. The way you talk about trees, it's, it's, it's palpable. I, I, I can't believe that you, of all, of all pigs, don't think you're artistic. <laughs> well, when I draw pictures of you, I can see, I guess, flashes of what I might be good at. Uh, the way your hair moves in the wind. You're too kind, but I'm afraid we could never be together, for I am not, I'm not a rich horse and could never be with my kind of line of work. That's not true. It's only a matter of some time. You're going to be rich. You're so good at so many things, running races. Me, just a pig. No, you're not just a pig, you're my muse. Really? The that horse lies down on a big pile of hay in a welcoming manner. He wants the pig to join him, but they're caught in moments of unknowledge within intimacy. Please, sit with me on this hay. I guess I could for a... Mm. Oh, it's softer than it seems it would be. Yes, you're so used to, to slop that, that your mind hasn't been opened up to the finer but simple pleasures. Take off that princess mantle and, and embrace your inner artist. You know, when the hay's around your hair like that, it looks like the sun's rising. Yes. And when the sun is around your, your face, it reminds me of, it reminds me of the unattainable, what I possibly couldn't have. But I do enjoy the fact that you are spending time with little old me. Can I say something crazy? Yes. Let's pretend for a moment that we finally have all the things that we wish we had. Okay, here it goes. Huh. 
Well, this certainly feels nice. <laughs> sure does. <laughs> and curtain. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, players. Um, what inspired you to choose this work to put in, in this slot in this season, Robin? Well, to be honest, the pleasure to work with Anna Sophia, JoJo, and Charlotte was just too, too great to pass. So the opportunity to get into their minds, their creativity, and their genius was important for Washington Improv Theater. And then we did it because there's a light feeling to the play, but it's so... Honest simultaneously, how did, how did you feel about the writing that they do? I found it difficult to learn the words because those feelings that we all know, once they're, once you see them and you have to acknowledge them and say them, oh, life on the other side. Yeah, it was, it was a real experience reading, reading this script. Uh, it taught me a lot of things about myself as a person and, and as an artist, and I think, I think we can all uh, take a lot away from that. To, to experience the acting, I actually, I rode Alex as if he was a horse. It's true, yes, yeah. Yes. And there were times when he bucked, mm. and there were times when he neighed, and like any relationship. So we worked very hard to ensure this play's success. Uh, th thank you, thank you for your dedication. Uh, Yes. And well, you got to go method sometimes, Mark. I suppose. I suppose. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, the, the next piece that, that we are presenting a bit of, um, we actually cannot, we cannot share the script because we're still in the process of devising this show. It's a full ensemble piece um, set in the Gothic Southern style called Blug, Bl sorry, Blood Magnolia. Um, it tells the story of a family being ripped apart by large agricultural concerns. And central to the story are two rival sisters who have both been sort of twin matriarchs of this family since they were young. Um, the, the theme of this show is really, uh, well, my collaborator David put it best when he said it was food everywhere. Um, and that's really a statement not only about this family and how they depend on their agricultural economy to survive, but also what's happening in America, uh, where there is food literally everywhere. There are several pizzas backstage. No one asked for them. They just put them there, assuming we would eat them. Um, so if each player could simply introduce the character that you're playing and either what you've found to be the most inspiring part of them, or even just your favorite line um, that, that so far we've devised in the process. And we'll just go left to right, if you don't mind. And I think by, by the time we reach the end, you'll have a clear understanding of what this play is going to bring to Washington and why we're all so dedicated to this devising process. Laura, we'll start with you. So um, in Blood Magnolia, I play Sarah Jane, one of the sister matriarchs of the Whitaker family. Um, and I'm sorry, what did, what did you want to know, Mark? Uh, just what resonates for you the most about this mm -hmm. character, or if there's a specific line that we've devised already that you're really enjoying rolling over your tongue, you can share that line of dialogue. The phrase I keep coming back to with Sarah Jane is, food is love. And the line that resonates for me is, more, more. You'll eat my casserole and you'll like it, Billy. You'll like it. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Alex. Yes, th thank you. Yes, uh, well, the, the character that I play, of course, is, uh, is none other than uh, Ron Spittle. <laughs> uh, he's the, the carrot farmer. Uh, and, and boy, uh, what, a, what a role. Um, I, I never really gained an appreciation for, for um, the finer root vegetables until uh, really delving deep into this character. Um, especially the scene where, where he sells the carrots uh, to the sisters. And wh what about that scene touches you so much, Alex? Well, it really got me to think like, well, carrots do really possess all of these great qualities. They, they, they do really help you see better and, uh, and and they sure are orange. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Mark. 
Erica. In Blood Magnolia, I play Malil, Malil Hosner. She is a neighbor who is trying very hard to keep things together, trying very hard to keep things together. She's down on her luck, but she is trying to keep up appearances any way she can. And the line that has resonated with me, oh, I feel it rising in my chest right now. Donnie, come get your doves. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Zach, Zach, take us into your character. Sure. Um, well, I'm just, it's okay. No. Uh, I play, uh, in Blood Magnolia, I play Jasper. Uh, he's the rugged, handsome, sensual groundskeeper to Miss Sarah Jane. Um, and I can't shake the scene where my character, everything with us just comes to a head and there's a dramatic love scene. He, and his torso is coated with oil during this scene. Corn oil, uh, we have a Mazzola sponsorship for our... Thank you, thank you, Mazzola. Thank yeah. you so much. And uh, I think the most powerful line for me is when my character has just been backed into a corner by Sarah Jane. And he exclaims, Sorghum? Yeah, that, was it. that was it. Yeah, it's a reference from within the play. I think it'll make more sense. It makes when you're, a lot more sense watching. in the context yes. of the play. Yes. Moving right along, Caitlin, take us there. Um, so in Blood Magnolia, I play the character of Annie Walker, and she is new in town, and uh, Sarah Jane has been so nice to open up her home to this newcomer um, while she kind of finds her way here. And um, unfortunately for her, she um, likes to produce all organic vegetables, um, which is not something that this town necessarily agrees upon. Um, she's kind of bringing something new to town and there are some people who are coming head to head with her on, on the way that she produces her vegetables and they don't quite agree with it so there's a bit of tension within the town and um, she kind of, um, you know, accidentally starts having feelings for Jasper and that also causes some tensions between her and Sarah Jane because Sarah Jane is very much onto her um, and uh, Annie Walker actually walks in on that love scene between the two of them and is put in a bit of a pickle. Um, but my favorite line that Annie Walker has in the show is, how can you feed your town poison? So, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Alex. Uh, so in, in uh, Blood Magnolia, I play the role of Kyle Clip, who is the neighborhood boy who no longer has a home. His family left him during the, uh, the, just shortly before the production begins. And uh, Kyle, the f my favorite line that I keep coming back to uh, with Kyle is, what, wh why won't nobody play with me? He's very alone at this point in time. And I, and I think my, the, the pivotal moment for Kyle is when he's in the yard playing with a, a pack of M80 firecrackers and he loses his hand due to an accident of holding on to that firecracker for too long and he sheds his own blood on the magnolia patch. Thank you. That, that achieved the central metaphor for the play. It all came from that scene, which we improvised. Jenna. Um, yeah, so in Blood Magnolia, I actually play Betty May, uh, sister to Sarah Jane. Um, yeah, I, I love you too. Um, but not actually in, um, during the play. It's, it's, we actually have quite a tension um, because it turns out I am uh, very much into Jasper, the groundskeeper, um, as well. And, you know, being Betty Mae, she's, she's not as attractive as her older sister, Sarah Jane. So, uh, you know, she feels very much like um, the black sheep of the family. Um, and in comparison to Annie and Sarah Jane, she is a dog. Um, she's hideous. Um, 
and actually, um, I, I'd say my favorite line um, is when I walk in on Sarah Jane and Jasper, uh, Jasper's torso, of course, covered in Mazzola corn oil, and I- Totally covered. Thank I you, I just Mazzola. wanna emphasize, he is totally covered in oil during yes, this yes, scene. Yes, yes. It's, it's, it's my favorite scene, I'm sorry. It made rehearsals actually really, really difficult. Yeah. This is- To this focus is not on anything else. when. When this man has his shirt off and he is covered in oil, like, you can't look anywhere else. No, no. Um, and so, so when I, I walk in, I say, I want to slide on you like a slip and slide. Indeed, indeed. Thank you, Jenna. Um, I'm afraid we're actually out of time. So the roles that Robin and Jules will be playing in the play will remain a mystery until tickets for Blood Magnolia go on sale, which should be happening at 7.15 tonight. That again will be the final production of Washington Improv Theater's Blockbuster 27, sorry, 2017-2018 season. We hope you will all subscribe. Uh, please join me in thanking our cast of actors and our crew for making this page to stage performance possible. You've been a terrific, terrific audience. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura, Alex, Erica, Zach, Caitlin, Alex, Jenna, Robin, and Jules. And thank you, audience. Thank you, and good night.